Court of Appeals, Division One, is now in session. Thank you. Good morning. Please be seated. This is the time set for oral argument in the matter of Edgar Alonzo Dominguez versus the Honorable George Foster, State of Arizona. Um, we have G. Montgomery, Maricopa County Attorney, Real Party and Interest, our special action number 17-0284. Each side will have 20 minutes within which to make their arguments here this morning. Appellant or petitioner may reserve some portion of that for rebuttal, but it's up to you to keep track of your time in that regard. We have uh, gone through the record, we've read the briefs, we've conferenced this, this case. So we have a fair understanding of the underlying facts um, and procedural history. Uh, so please keep that in mind as you make your arguments here this morning. We're recording the proceedings, both by audio and video. The video portion will be available on YouTube in a matter of days. Um, as you approach the podium, we'd ask that you identify yourself and who you represent for the recording purposes. And with that, petitioner may proceed. May it please the court. I am Angela L. Walker, here with Anna Unterberger on behalf of Edgar Alonso <coughs> Dominguez. I'd like to reserve three minutes of rebuttal. The state dep deprived Mr. Dominguez of due process when it failed to re-instruct or remind the grand jury on May 10th that proof of actual reflection is required in premeditated murder cases. Now, the, this subjected Mr. Dominguez to what the Thompson court termed as the chance result, which would, um, which would lead to an unconstitutional uh, risk to Mr. Dominguez that the grand jury did not um, find probable cause and relieve the state of its burden that Mr. Dominguez formed an intent to murder, reflected upon that, and then indeed uh, intended to kill and, and carried out uh, a murder in the case. Standing aside for a moment, uh, what O'Meara says about what the prosecutor must do b before commencing a particular case. What's the, what's, what's the response to the state's contention that while Thompson established a due process standard for a jury trial, it doesn't apply to the grand jury's consideration of a matter? The Arizona Supreme Court in, in, Crimmins, in Crimmins and Trebus has applied due process to the grand jury level. Now, the fact that the Supreme Court in Thompson held that the premeditated statute is only constitutional as interpreted by the Supreme Court, doesn't that doesn't dissolve at the grand jury proceeding. That doesn't, the state doesn't, the statute doesn't just become constitutional because the grand jury proceeding is uh, different than a trial jury. Due process is due process. So um, the Omiara court and the Thompson court both afford the due process. It's a well-recognized constitutional precept in, in um, Arizona and nationwide set down from the United States Supreme Court. Could, you, could, could it be said that, that in Thompson, the court said that, 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 uh, that not, notwithstanding that the statute defines premeditation in a particular way, uh, to convict someone under that, that definition would be a violation of that person's due process rights? It, it would be. It leaves the, it leaves a person who's standing trial at an unconstitutional risk that the grand, the, that the petite jury, the trial jury would not be differentiating between a premeditated first degree murder and an intentional knowing second degree murder. The only difference is reflection. So there has to be a constitutional way to discern the two. Reflection is it. The way the premeditated statute is written is it says specifically proof of actual reflection is not required. Reading that, any common person um, would understand that as meaning that the state does not have to prove reflection. That's not correct. The state must have, the, continues to have the burden. Um, paragraph 32 of 
Thompson specifically says the risk that the jury may be misled into believing or relieving the state of its burden to prove reflection is so great that it disapproved the premeditated statute definition uh, and completely rewrote a, uh, a, a jury instruction that disregarded entirely the language except for the language regarding sudden, um, sudden quarrel or heat of passion. Now, go on. Um, with due process applying directly to the um, grand jury level, it's it's led Mr. Dominguez to be in a situation that, in this particular case, without being reinstructed on May 10th, with 93 days passing, there's no clear record that the grand jury had anything to refer back to that corrective language under Thompson. So it, the jury is essentially in Mr. Dominguez's individual case was left with a, the situation of having to remember three months later that proof of reflection is required. Can, can I ask a question about that? Because sure. at, at the beginning of the grand jury process, when, the, when they are given those, those uh, they read the statutes, um, and that there was a clarification relative to Thompson given, um, the grand jurors, were they given a book of the statutes? Is the clarification also included? The What we can tell from the um, Exhibit A that was attached to the Appendix 9, which is the May 10th, is there they refer to merely the statutes. They don't refer to a, a clarification. Um, referring to the supplemented record, which is the February 6th transcript, there is a mention of Thompson, but we don't see in those two pages that the state supplemented that there is any mention that the jury will be provided that transcript or the Thompson case. So the record that we have is that there is no real way to refer back to the Thompson other than the state instructing them or reminding them. In the fact that due process requires the state as the impartial actor in a grand jury proceeding, which is uh, a non-adversarial proceeding, there's no judge present, there's no defense attorney present, so it's incumbent on the state to set aside any adversarial uh, bent that they may have and instruct the jury on all relevant law, as Crimmins and Shrebus has set forth. So it's really relying on the state to remind them that if they refer to ARS 13-1101 that the, the grand jury does need to know or be reminded that that statute is incorrect. It, proof of reflection is required. So we're, we're the, the Supreme Court's decision in Omeria is settled law, I think, that, that all the state, all the prosecutor needs to do when he or she commences a new matter is to remind the, the grand jurors of the relevant statutes and I bel and have read them before at some point before and I believe Amira t also talks about uh, yeah due process requires only that the prosecutor read read all relevant statutes to the grand jury at some point uh, provide them with a copy of those statutes to refer to and then ask them if they want any statutes reread or or clarified would you agree that that's that's the construct that we're under I believe, I, yes, I would agree that we're under that construct with the caveat that Omi, Omira dealt with commonly understood terms. And so the question is whether if, if Thompson requires that the, the grand jury be instructed about the Thompson clarification or correction, as you say, the question is whether Omira requires that when the prosecutor commences a case up against a particular person that the prosecutor, that, that the grand jury have a copy of the clarification or correction in front of them and be directed to that as well? I believe so. I think that that OMIR or OMIRA could be interpreted that way, that as long as the grand jury in some way has the ability to refer back to the, the clarifying instruction, that would be adequate. If they don't have that, either in their statute book or they don't have a transcript of the grand jury proceeding where the clarification was read, then it's incumbent on the state to remind them. Um, the record we have is is that really we only have a statute book. That's what's been told to the grand jury um, is to refer to the statute, and there's no indication that 
there's in that statute a pamphlet, like a pocket part, okay. um, slipped in with the with a case or the the script that the state reads during impanelment or something for the grand jury that if they needed to, they could go back and look at it. Have you got any problems with the language? Is there anything impermissible about the words with which the prosecutor instructed, g gave the grand jury the Thompson clarification in February? Yes. Uh, in the, the record below, we did not have the impanelment transcript. Now that it's been provided and uh, reviewed extensively in preparation uh, for this argument and the, the special action, there is a number of issues that I believe are um, making the state's Thompson instruction problematic. They did not read Thompson directly. Uh, what the state did was, and, and to remind, to, to reiterate, the Thompson instruction does away with the premeditated, the statutory definition. The state did a, a melding where it started with the first sentence of the, the definition of premeditated murder that's found in the statute and then slips in uh, Thompson. And the, the problem is, is under uh, paragraph 29 of Thompson, there's a discussion about an overemphasis on the passage of time and that if the, the, the state were to rely on merely the passage of time, it's relieving the burden of proving that during that passage of time, actual reflection occurred. So I would ask that if the court were interested in that, we either do supplemental briefing or ask for a remand back to the trial court where that could be rebriefed now that that issue has been presented. And it wasn't clear until the pellet record that, that indeed there could be problems, or we believe there are problems with the Thompson instruction given in February 6th. Hmm. The, I did want to um, refer back to, I believe the um, Judge Johnson asked about Omira and about applying the, uh, does due process apply from the trial jury, petit jury down to uh, grand jury. And Omiara in its analysis at page 578 did look at trial jury cases and then apply them to the grand jury cons uh, to the grand jury in that particular case. So there is precedent for this court to look at uh, the, this, the uh, trial jury and the case law developed there and apply that at the grand jury stage. Now, due process, is that's a different situation where you have a commonly understood term. Here we have a, a statute that as commonly understood is not constitutional unless the, the Thompson clarification is given. And as I, constructed it in my head, it's almost like Thompson with a clause proof of uh, proof of reflection is not required. It's almost like the Supreme Court put a carrot in and inserted direct evidence of proof of reflection is not required. That carrot and adding that in language uh, conceptually is what makes that statutory definition constitutional. So without it, just left to their own devices, any reasonable person would be misled by believing the state is relieved from its burden of, um, of proving reflection in the case. And the Thompson court thought that that was so significant to require and and disapprove on that grounds, but also the third ground or the second ground would be any emphasis of the statutory definition on the amount of time passing could be too much emphasis that it's also relieving the burden. So Thompson is really a two-part case dealing with the direct language from the statute as well as the inference that can be drawn about the passage of time replacing um, the, the requirement that the state prove reflection. At the trial setting, that would be beyond a reasonable doubt. At the grand jury setting, that would be probable cause. Okay. If there's any other questions, we reserve time for rebuttal. Yes, that'd be fine, counsel. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Eisenberg. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honors, and may it please the Court. My name is Mitchell Eisenberg. I'm a Deputy County Attorney with the Maricopa County Attorney's Office, and I'm here uh, to represent the State of Arizona. 
Um, we would urge the court at this juncture to decline jurisdiction in this case because there is no controversy here. As the court is aware from having read um, the pleadings, this began as a motion for remand. Um, as the Francis court stated, um, the measure um, for a motion to remand um, for appellate review is an abuse of discretion. And in this particular case, Judge Foster did not abuse his discretion in making his determination. Additionally, um, in the Francis court, they also discussed findings of fact. And one of the things that they said was that they, the appellate court should defer to the trial court with regard to any findings of fact explicitly or implicitly made. Um, the court had questions about the Thompson language Judge Foster had questions about the Thompson language as well. And during uh, the oral argument portion on the motion to remand, Judge Foster specifically asked the petitioner about the Thompson language and said, was the Thompson language um, given at any time? The petitioner told um, Judge Foster in all candor that he was unaware of whether or not the Thompson language had been given. Unfortunately, and, and as I indicated in both my response and in my request to supplement, I did not include the impanelment um, transcript or the portion of the impanelment uh, transcript dealing with the Thompson language. Um, but as the court is aware, um, and Judge Tom, and excuse me, Judge Foster um, made determinations, um, the the Thompson language was in fact given, and. Judge Foster then made the determination that because the petitioner was the moving party and had the burden to show that there was a substantial right that had been violated, that was not found and therefore the motion to remand was denied. In reality, the Thompson language was given and due process was satisfied. And Your Honor, uh, you discussed the O'Meara case. The O'Meara versus Gottsfield is the seminal case and it is still good law. It requires that the state should do three things with respect to um, the grand jury. One, um, that the prosecutor read all relevant statutes to the grand jury. That in fact was done here. It's done every time there is an impanelment. Number two, um, that the grand jurors be provided with copies of any statutes to refer to during deliberations. There was a question that was asked um, of the petitioner as to whether or not the Thompson language was specifically included in the packet um, to the grand jurors um, to have at, during the grand jury proceedings. That's not a part of the record. And, and I would like to be able to tell the court, yes, it was or no, it was not. Unfortunately, I do not have that uh, that information off the top of my head. So I cannot give the court that information. Can um, it be determined? Um, I believe it can be determined, yes, Your Honor. It would, it would simply take going to the, the grand jury and, and checking to see if the um, if the books that are provided to the grand jury contain the Thompson language. I can make assumptions, um, but I'm not going to do that here. I can only tell the court what I know. While, while we're on the topic, the, I, I remember some prosecutor telling us in some case that what happens is at the beginning in February right. uh, when the the grand jury is impaneled that the statutes are so long that actually they've been recorded and and they're actually a, the grand jury it's not as if the prosecutor sitting them sitting there reading to the grand jury there's a recording that's played for them is that the case well your honor I I don't know, in, in all honesty. It's been so long since I actually did that with the grand jury. When, when I did it with the grand jury, no. It was actually read to the members of the grand jury. It was not a recording. Um, but again, I can't tell you in 2017 whether or not it's actually, there's a prosecutor there that does in fact read it. In looking at the transcript, it appears to me that there is a prosecutor who is there um, d discussing the matter with the grand jury. Um, but unfortunately, I can't tell you that. Again, the only way um, would be if, for example, um, there had been a motion for reconsideration at the trial court level, um, and then there could have been other determinations made. But at this point, um, with this record, I, I cannot tell you, honestly, and, and I apologize for that. But it's not part of the record, and, and I just don't have that information off the top of my head. What I can tell you, 
as Petitioner pointed out, is when the grand jury is impaneled, as part of the reading of the premeditation statute, there is specific mention of the Thompson case and the Thompson language dealing with premeditation. And, Your Honor, as you pointed out, um, the statutes and the case law is vast, and there are a number of things. So simply because the, um, the Thompson language may not have or the, the case may not have been read verbatim, there was sufficient information given to the grand jury to allow them to access the Thompson language along with the premeditation statutes um, that are required for a first-degree murder uh, consideration. What's the state's position as to what Thompson held? Thompson um, clarified the premeditation statute, um, and it, it created additional language um, for the trial court or a trial jury to consider in determining whether or not a, a, a criminal defendant reflected um, and then acted. Specifically, as to the definition of premeditation, what did Thompson do? And I apologize, Your Honor. I don't. I don't have the language in front of me. I didn't. Well, did Thompson um, explain premeditation in a way that's um, more in depth? The defense it, would argue in contradiction to the statute? It's not in contradiction to the statute. It, 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 but it explained premeditation. It did help to explain premeditation. And so isn't Thompson part and parcel of the definition of premeditation in the state of Arizona? It is not part and parcel part of the definition of premeditation. What it is is, is, is a separate jury instruction that is given to a trial jury um, to aid them in understanding what premeditation is in the state of Arizona. But it, it must be given in conjunction with the premeditation statutory definition. It must be given at the trial court level. And there, why is that? There, because the, the Thompson court made the decision that when a trial jury was considering whether or not um, to, to find premeditation, that there was additional clarification that had to be, be um, given. And the county attorney's office has determined that when you impanel a jury and you instruct them on premeditation, it is um, incumbent upon you in the course of pursuing justice to instruct them also on uh, the definition of premeditation it, as stated in Thompson. Under our ethical rule 3.8, we have an obligation as, as prosecutors to make sure um, that justice is served. Even though Thompson did not extend its holding to the grand jury, the determination was made that the Thompson language would be read in, at the impanelment to the grand jury. All right. So isn't it, wouldn't it be fair to say that if at the grand jury level, you're going to present the statutory definition of Thompson, I'm sorry, of premeditation at all, then the Thompson uh, instruction should be given as well? In other words, you're instructing at impanelment on the statutory and the Thompson definition of premeditation. Right. Then when you're presenting an individual case, um, is it fair to only present the statutory or direct grand jurors to the statutory definition but not tell them about Thompson? The grand jurors are not directed specifically, and, and that's an issue with respect to some of the cases that were cited um, by petitioner. What happens when the grand jury is, is seated to consider a particular case is um, the grand jury is reminded that they have all of the statutes in the law before them, and then they are reminded that some of the applicable statutes would include certain things, okay? Thompson is included with the premeditation statute. It is included at the time of impanelment. So it's not necessary to point out again in a first degree murder uh, presentation the Thompson language. It's already been presented and the grand jury is already told 
some of the things that may help you in making a determination in this case include certain statutes. Including by, the statutory definition on premeditation. And by, by um, <clears throat> when, when you talk about the statutory um, definition of premeditation, it would include the Thompson language, even though specifically you're not telling the grand jury, oh, by the way, don't forget the Thompson language. The Thompson language is part and parcel of the presentation to the grand jury at the time of the impanelment, so there's nothing that separates um, the Thompson language or the Thompson decision from the premeditation statute that's given. Not at impanelment, but when presenting an individual case, it is separated if you make reference to the statutory definition without mentioning the Thompson instruction. I, I would respectfully disagree with that, Your Honor, because the, um, the person who is discussing the potentially applicable statutes talks in terms of some of the statutes that may be applicable or may help you include certain <coughs> statutes. By the by indicating a particular statute, a the premeditation statute, for example, part and parcel, you are also um, indicating the the Thompson language, which is part of the presentation of the premeditation so statute. So are you saying, just so that I understand, are you saying then that when the grand jurors are directed to the statutory definition, they are then to recall that they had been advised of the Thompson instruction at impanelment? Because the Thompson language is included with the premeditation, and again, I apologize if I had um, the information here or we had a better record at the trial court level, and again, I apologize for that. Um, it may be much clearer in how that presentation was made, um, specifically the information that's given to the grand jury to have before them every day when they walk in the door. Unfortunately, because we're here in this posture and we're not at the trial court level, I can't, I don't have the, the information to supplement the record. But what I, what I would suggest to the court is because the grand jurors are given paper of all of that information, I, I can and only assume that, and again, it may be the wrong place to, to assume this, but I can only assume that because the Thompson language is read uh, along with the premeditation statute that they are given the Thompson language inclusive of the premeditation statute. So when you refer back to the premeditation statute, it then includes the Thompson language. What, what, what uh, would be required to supplement the record? How would the record be supplemented on that fact? Would, could it be done by way of an affidavit by the prosecutor? or How else would it be done? Um, I, it, a couple of ways, Your Honor. I think an, an affidavit by the prosecutor at the trial court level, um, including the, uh, the information, the, the paper information, much like um, a transcript, um, as we did both at the trial court level of the specific um, presentation and here with the impanelment, it may just be a matter of attaching the paperwork that shows that, that the members of the grand jury have the premeditation statute and the Thompson language. Copies I think of the paperwork that the grand jury is actually given. Yes, Your Honor, that's correct. So I think either way. You, you said, uh, changing topics, it's just like, you said that uh, Ethical Rule 3.8 re requires prosecutor to, at the commencement of the impanelment, to uh, uh, give the Thompson clarification. Do, or I, that's what I understood you to say. But the point, but my question is, does the state concede that uh, due process requires that a grand jury be instructed on the Thompson clarification? No, Your Honor, the state does not concede that. Well, why is uh, that so? Because the Thompson decision dealt with a trial jury. It did not extend its holding to a grand jury, and certainly the, court, the Supreme Court could have done so if it chose to do so. It specifically dealt with a trial jury and instructions to a trial jury. Um, 
there is a difference, as O'Meara pointed out, there, there is a difference between a grand jury and a trial jury. There is a difference in the job of a trial jury and a grand jury. So a grand jury, it's, it's not necessary to instruct the grand jury on everything as uh, a court would on a trial jury. In this particular case, the reference to um, ethical rule 3.8 was simply that we have an obligation as prosecutors. Um, we made the determination that even though due process doesn't require that the Thompson language be given because Thompson itself does not require it, that because we have an obligation to uphold that we are including the Thompson language without directive of the court. Okay. So. But, but, but what, why, getting back to due process though, if Thompson held that, that the premeditation statute uh, by itself uh, does not afford a defendant const constitutional protections to which the defendant is entitled, in other words, that, the, that it's wrong, the statute is wrong, why doesn't that legal principle apply in the grand jury context? Well, certainly, Your Honor, as, as the court is well aware, um, you have a due process right in the grand jury. The question is, to what degree do you have that due process right? And in Thompson, the Thompson court dealt specifically with the trial jury. It didn't, it didn't in any way deal with the grand jury. It could have. It certainly could have said um, that the, the due process right of the Thompson language clarifying premeditation um, is extended throughout. It didn't do that. So it's our position that we have afforded a, this petitioner due process under O'Meara versus Gottsfield. Um, that Thompson does not specifically extend to grand jury proceedings, but we have done so. Um, and that due process is satisfied simply mm -hmm. by the three-prong approach of um, O'Meara versus Gottsfield. And that's been satisfied, and it continues to be satisfied, and it will continue to be satisfied. <coughs> again, Your Honor, um, getting back to your point about about the record, and, and again, I apologize uh, for doing a poor job at the trial court level, but it, it would have been much easier for all concerned had we attached things such as the um, the impanelment transcript or if um, the trial court had the, the question to um, attach the whatever is is given to um, the, the grand jury in the grand jury room for them to consider when the, um, the presentation is made. And perhaps that's a, a better way to do things in the future. But in terms of what we're dealing with here today, um, again, we've got um, O'Meara versus Gottsfield. Due process is satisfied um, by the presentation. Um, that there is a difference between the grand jury and a, and a trial uh, jury. And in all uh, candor, in this particular case, there is no prejudice to the petitioner um, because regardless of what the court may find, the Thompson language was in fact given at the impanelment. Um, one of the things, or one of the cases that uh, defense pointed out, or excuse me, the petitioner pointed out was the Crimmins case. Um, and I just want to clarify, the Crimmins case um, was determined um, as an anomaly, if you will, because it dealt with some specific facts. Um, in that particular case, there was an issue dealing with a citizen's arrest, and the court found um, that the grand jury at no time was informed of any statute or any law dealing with citizen's arrest. And because the, the statutes had never been given either at impanelment um, or during the actual proceeding that it had, the case then had to be remanded for a new finding of probable cause because the statutes had never been given. Um, and the specific omission rendered the presentation um, less than fair and impartial. But O'Meara then clarified in Crimmins and said, Crimmins doesn't, doesn't extend to, to 
uh, Omira generally because it dealt with a specific set of facts and circumstances, much like CORZEP, which, um, which the petitioner um, cited to in his brief as well. Um, I would suggest to the court that State v. Jessen, no statute or rule requires the prosecution to frame instructions for each case under investigation um, is applicable, and I see I'm out of time. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Eisenberg. <clears throat> <clears throat> Ms. Walker. I'd like to start by uh, refocusing back that this is about May 10th. There's a lot of focus been on February 6th, but at the, the motion level and at the special action level, the May 10th grand jury proceeding is one that's most important because 93 days had already passed from February 6th reading of Thompson. Now, on May 10th, the state took it upon itself sua sponte without request from the jury, the grand jurors, to remind them about the statutes that may be relevant. That decision to remind the grand jurors about the statute triggered their obligation, their legal obligation to instruct on all relevant law. It, it's should not be contested that Thompson is relevant law. Um, and it, it defies logic that a, a Supreme Court case defining premeditation in a constitutional way to avoid striking down a statute under the, con under the principles of statutory instruction doesn't apply at the due process, at the grand jury proceeding. So <clears throat> the state as a legal advisor, when it refers the grand jury to a specific statute, must ensure that the grand jurors know that that specific statute is problematic and could be misleading to them. and such that without the clarifying language, it's not constitutional. The, um, but what should we do, we right now do, given that we, we don't know whether the, the written materials included a copy of the clarification? My second point would be addressing the record in the case. This court, the, the state has alleged that it does not have the ability to supplement the record. The state has already requested, and this court granted, a supplement of the record with two pages from the February 6th transcript. Presumably, the state had the entire impanelment transcript of February 6th uh, that it could have provided to the court. And this court is has the, the discretion to order the state to further supplement the record with the entire impanelment tr transcript from February 6th. That may clear up some of the misunderstandings or assumptions being made. But I would contend it doesn't, that the, the type of information that is in the record is important, but it's not controlling about whether this court should reach the decision that due process requires the reminding of the grand jury. Whether the state, what this court, uh, what petitioner asked this court to do is to, rule, is to rule that due process requires the grand jury in some respect have the ability to refer back to Thompson. Whether that means that when uh, uh, the state is instructing the grand jury on a particular case like Mr. Dominguez's on May 10th, that they merely say, we refer you to 131101, don't forget uh, act, proof of actual reflection is required. It could be that simple. It could be that the state would be ordered to provide the pocket part uh, of the Thompson uh, language that it chooses, although we would contend it has to be accurate to the Thompson case and not a hodgepodge where there's an undue influence or undue emphasis on the passage of time. Uh, it could be that the Thompson case law in its entirety is provided to the grand jury. The, the, the state can be at its leisure to decide how it wishes to do it, but due process requires that, and the court doesn't need a further clarification of the record to reach that constitutional decision. Uh, so we would ask the court reach that decision and not remand to supplement the record and just rule outright, give the state the ability to decide how it wishes to ad adequately advise the, the grand jury um, as to the Thompson language in this case and the, the, the statutory language. Now, the state struggled with defining Thompson. 
Thompson in paragraph 32 and 35 clearly states that as interpreted, the, the statute is constitutional as interpreted. The Supreme Court recognized that it is under obligation to construe a statute constitutionally if it is able to do it. It chose to do that by adding in the clarification that proof of ref- reflection is required and that the state is, um, th- that the statutory definition is merely relieving the state of proving that by direct evidence. But that direct evidence needs to be known, that that caveat needs to be known by the grand jury and the trial jury so that they don't relieve the state of their burden of proving reflection. That, as the statute as written right now, relieves the state of its burden, and that's why it's the, the Supreme Court has said it's not permitted to give the statutory definition. Now, the state... Um, talked about Thompson and uh, the important part of what is provided on February 6th that further complicates it is Judge Johnson's question about whether the language was adequate uh, or correct about reflecting Thompson. That's another issue that I believe needs to be addressed that can be done with a um, supplementing of this particular record uh, with further briefing on that particular issue that would maybe expedite some of a potential second special action in the case, or it can be done by ordering remand with a brief briefing on that issue. Um, I'm running short on time. There's one other topic I would like to address, and that was Omiara. Uh, Omiara is Arizona Supreme Court case law that is controlling on this court, but there is an important distinction, and that is it's knowingly was the definition at issue there. That is a commonly understood term. The common understanding of the statutory definition here is that it relieves the state of its burden unconstitutionally. So this, the emphasis on Omiara can't be so great to overcome and say that that doesn't, um, that the state is not required at the grand jury level to provide that um, Thompson language to the grand jury. With that, if there's no further questions, we would ask that the court uh, accept jurisdiction, grant relief, and remand to the trial court with a finding that due process does require the grand jury to be re-instructed or reminded whenever uh, dealing in a first-degree murder case when the state brings to their attention the statutory definition of premeditation. Thank you, counsel. Appreciate the arguments uh, presented here this morning as well as the briefing in this matter. We'll take this under advisement. We'll issue a written decision in due course. With that, uh, we are adjourned. Thank you.